me. But uh, <laughs> welcome to the Never Broke Again. I'm Josh, along with Andrew, and we have a special guest, professional golfer Len Matisse is joining us, and Len's going to talk about his golf journey, how he saved money while he was on tour, and talk about the skills that he learned on the golf course and in life so that he'll never go broke again. So, Len, thanks for hopping on. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Good so, yeah. to meet you guys. Absolutely. Andrew, what questions you got for Len? You said you had a list of them before we hopped on here. Oh, wow. You want, you want to just get, get straight <laughs> to the chase. Yeah, I've got a buddy who's a fan. So he, he I said you were going to be on, so he texted me texted me some questions yeah we'll go for well I'll well maybe four wait can i inter, can i interject right. for a second yeah of course yeah let me just give you a just a, a brief 30 second thing about where i am right now okay okay grew originally grew up in new york been been in high school here in jacksonville florida went to wake forest university on a golf scholarship turned pro right after college was in no man's land at that point because now i'm just a rookie pro trying to make any tour and then was able to get on PGA Tour for about 13, 14 years and now playing in Champions Tour events. So I've been doing, you know, I've been playing golf since I was 10 years old and been doing what I wanted to do my whole life. So very fortunate to be able to have that as a career and now have a combination of still playing in golf pro events on Champions Tour. And I have a foundation that I'm able to give back to kids here in Jacksonville where I started when I was 15 years old. So it's been a great run so far. Being a pro athlete is just the craziest thing, especially golf, because you can play. We had a surfer on, a pro surfer on, but he had to retire. Golf, you can play into, I don't know, I guess in perpetuity. But it's like, hey, I never want to grow up. But like, I I mean, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but it's like, it's amazing because you just play a sport and that's your that's the job. That's like, I wanted to, you know, I, I wish I could do that. I was not good enough, you know, but you know, the, the market, I played tennis futures tennis and the market was like, you ain't good enough kid. So I was like, all right, I'll teach it. Right. Cause that's, that's what happens. So you take your shot and then you're like, so I taught it for, for a while. And that was my thing in my twenties. But I mean, I wish I could have made it played on the biggest stages. Yeah, and very, very fortunate with golf that we could play it our whole lives. You know, I mean, we can, you know, you can play uh, now this Champions Tour. There are guys on the Champions Tour at 65, 68, 70 years old. Larry Nelson played till he was like 73 years old. And just, you know, just uh, it's something that obviously when guys are playing in their 60s in the 70s they still love it they still have that desire they're healthy enough to do it so of all the sports it's probably the luckiest sport that you can play your whole life and and still get paid for it what's amazing is in your intro you said you started at 10 that seems so late well nowadays you know i mean i was i was nine or ten and just starting my head i have two older brothers that play golf uh they're pros so, you know, they were always, what are they? They're, they're like six, seven, eight years older than me. So they were always better, you know, and I was always looking up to them. So I actually uh, got better quicker because of them. You know, they were always around. So I would watch, learn, learn what to do, learn what not to do, and then just strive to be a little bit better. And I was always the youngest brother. So I really, uh, I really got, you know, uh, a, a big break that way um, because I, I was always kind of uh, a few years ahead of my age. Yeah. How do you, how do you keep golf fun now, Len? You've been playing since you're 10, just like anything in life. It can, it can get frustrating. Golf can be a frustrating game. How have you kept it fun to have this sort of longevity here? Yeah, it could definitely beat you up, you know, and you just have to, I think you have to look at the big picture. Like one of my, one, my, my long-term coach, uh, he's down in Miami, Jim McLean. He said to me, look, he goes, you know, say I'm, a, say, I'm, say I'm in eighth place going into the Players' Championship on Sunday, you know, and it's high pressure because if you have a really good round, you might have a chance to win the tournament, you know, and, and make that $2 million payout, have a five-year exemption and all that stuff, you know. So it could drive you a little crazy on the, uh, on the future, you know, like what it could mean to you, but yet you still have to break it down to it is another round of golf. And, you know, you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself. So all these things kind of take a beating 
uh, in your mind that it, it could possibly do that. So he said to me, he goes, look, you go out there, you're going to probably shoot 65 to 75. That's the reality, you know? So just put all of that stuff aside and just go play a game that you love to play and keep it as simple as possible. So I think that philosophy for me, you know, like when I go out, there'll, there'll be times when I don't make a birdie. I mean, I'm trying as hard, you know, that, that hole looks, you know, instead of four and a half inches wide, it, it, it looks like this, you know, how's the ball fit in that hole? And then there are times when from 30 feet, you just putt and it goes in and it's just incredible. So that long-term kind of mindset of you're going to get good breaks, you're going to get lip outs and just kind of roll with the punches. So I think it's a, it's definitely a perspective that you should take in, in order. Some, some people that I knew that junior golfers that were 16, 17, 18 years old would win by eight shots in a junior tournament, like an all world junior tournament. And then two years later, they're not playing golf anymore. So that is just a mindset of they just fried out. You know, they didn't have that perspective of, it's okay to finish third. It's not the end of the world, you know, and keep going. Moderation, moderation, moderation. Right? Yeah. And find those, right. find those levels. So you, did you find the moderation? And, do you think earlier on? Is that, yeah, I did. I had a good base and isn't that true in anything really? Yeah. You know, in, I don't know. Is it though? Is it, is moderation the key? I'm not sure. Well, in anything like, you know, in nutrition and in exercise yeah. and in family, in family life and friends and work, I mean, it's okay to be above and beyond extreme in certain things, but in life, I mean, you know, I think that perspective of, uh, you know, kind of somewhere, you know, in a parameter is a good thing. It seems like in golf and in business or whatever you, someone may be doing, those who just stay present in the moment and aren't thinking about like, yo, this could be a $2 million payday. It seems like those are the people who are very consistent and have that sort of longevity. Like, is that what you've seen with people that you might've competed with? Like, man, you could have been like, that dude had all the potential in the world, but he's a basket case. He can't keep it together yeah, or something well, they, like but, that. Yeah, definitely. I've seen, I've seen um, players that are kind of nice guys, like nice guys off the course and, easy going. And then when they get on the course, just crazy psycho, you know, like breaking clubs, curse words flying. And yeah. it's like, wow, they, they must, they must be having so much uh, expectations on themselves. That's just unnecessary. It's not, it can't sustain itself. It, mm -hmm. it, you can't sustain it. So, you know, they, they had, they probably have to do a check of, of what, you know, where, where they're, where they're, best performance should come from because it's not like that. And um, yeah, that, so you yeah. have to have that sustaining, but it, it, I think, uh, I think the golf is a lot like life where you're going to have your ups and downs, you know, but if you love to get up in the morning, if you love to go do what you want to do, you, you love to be with people you want to be around. You love to be on that golf course and strive for those really good shots, you know, make that like even a 50 foot putt, you, you you hit it this far from the hole, you know, that's a win, you know, you hit it in a bunker and you get that thing up and down. That's a win. So I think that is a, it's kind of a, a, a semblance of what life is as well. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the cool part is in life or in golf, if you make a mistake, you could still get up and down. That's right. Yeah, not perfect. We're not perfect out there, you know. Like, but what's your mindset when you hit a bad shot? Do you are you like crap? Do I I just hit a bad shot, or are you kind of just like, all right, like I gotta hit this bunker shot now? Like, walk us through that. Like, what's your yeah, mindset it, when you hit a bad it, shot? It does vary a little bit. So, like, typically it's like a five second. What the heck just happened there? You know, why did that thing slice into the woods? So, so five second, try and self coach myself so I don't do it again. And then as I'm, because you, we usually walk in tournaments, so there's a little bit of either walk time, or it doesn't matter if you're in a cart, there's a little bit of that time where, is this a pattern? You know, have I sliced the last six times into the woods? Or if it's just one out of whatever. And then, so that's a kind of a, a self-coach. And then move on. And then move on. Like, what's ahead? 
You know, like, is there water up on the green? Where do I want this next shot? Do I have to just chip out? Uh, should I should I go for that? Go for the gusto shot? You know, is it worth it? So so then it's a what's ahead? What's next? But you know, back to your other thought about future. Future gives me future kind of scares me. If I think about future stuff, it's a little scary. Like I like to plan, but if I find myself in the future of what this means, I take myself out of the present. And that creates a lot of anxiety, unnecessary anxiety that, you know, it, it is, I think to your point, it's very nice to be in the present and to be uh, very here, very, very present in, in what you're doing at the time. Mind, we're talking about mind control. I know this right? is out there. It's control out there. the thoughts in your head, right? Well, that's what a golf is. Golf is a mental and a mind game. Well, like, well, golf and life, right? I'll give yeah. you if I got yeah. if I got thoughts running through my mind at night, I can't get to sleep. Yeah. So I got to control yeah. the thoughts to get the bed. And if you're hanging out, but, yeah. If you're hanging out with your kids, right, and they want to go to the playground, and you've got like eight things going on about what's not so good about work or other things, you're not going to be present with them, and then the quality is not going to be good, and they they pick up like sponges, you know, of what's going on with you know, they're, they're, they're people that they're with. So um, mm -hmm. that quality is not going to be good and so on and so on. So it's not easy. We're human, but I think that's the best place to be. Did you uh, think like you'd you be this successful at golf, Len? Like do you, if you told your 10 year old self, you'd be where you'd be now. Do you think he would believe you? Uh, no, not, not at 10, 11, 12, because it was just like, you know, it was just like literally going into my backyard and chipping the ball around the house, you know, like one, two, three, and maybe one over the house. And it was all like, it was total play at that point. But at age 15, 16, you know, when I would go see like golf tournaments, when my dad would go take me to watch like the players championship or we grew up in New York. So like there was a, there was a big tournament in Westchester, New York that I would go watch the Jack Nicholas's and Tom Watson's. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and social media, there was no social media at that point. So it was only reading articles and newspapers and, and be able to watch on TV. So it wasn't as vivid as things could be now, you know, in the click of a button, you know, uh, a 15 year old, can see anything they want in the world that's going on. So it wasn't, it just wasn't as, as vivid, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. So, I mean, you got pulled into Wake Forest scholarship, right? Right. At an earth, that's pretty young to know you're, you're good, right? I think yeah. they're probably a good golf school. Yeah, they're really good. They're, they're like, you know, in the last 20 years, they're probably ranked in the top six, top seven. In, oh, wow. In, okay. in all the, yeah, they were. And it, when I was coming up through high school, they were in the top three or four. And um, so they were definitely on my map. And uh, I went to go visit five or six schools around the country. Um, and they were all the top schools. I won some big national amateur events when I was in high school. And I was the number one ranked junior uh, coming out of my senior year. So I had, oh, my, wow. I had my pick of wherever I wanted to go. And uh, so, it so was like, how, how did you, how did you get to that, to that spot? How did you, how did you get there? I think, I think, you know, having that, my dad was an amateur golfer. He was a three, four handicap. So he was really good. But then my brothers were really good and they played college golf. So I think learning from them really helped me. And then the move from New York down to Jacksonville um, was, I mean, just incredible for me. I went, I went just kind of like good to like really good because I took my passion and my skills and then I was able to play all year round against better golfers, you know, here in Florida compared to New York. And it just uh, increased, you know, everything. So my, like my, 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 for example, my high school average went from 38 to 36 to 35. So like in three years. So in my junior year of high school, I was averaging 35. Um, so I, I, I improved three shots per nine holes in about a three year period. That, that you're, it's a freak, right? Cause I, you know, 10, 10, I play tennis, right? Jersey tennis versus Florida tennis. It, it's not, it's not comparable, which I'm guessing golf, New York golf compared to Florida Same. golf is not comparable. Yeah. Like I was a top 30 player in tennis 
in Jersey, but I played the top 60 guy in Florida. I couldn't get a game off the guy. I was like, dude, what is, what is going on? But you, you were able to, to figure that out, which I, I, I just, how, how did you, I guess the older, the, you have little brother syndrome because yeah. the, 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 they did a, a study where the runners, the best runners in the world were mostly fourth or fifth children because they were always chasing their older brothers who were faster, not necessarily watching them run on a track. Really. Right. In a natural but it was way. Because yeah. They were chasing them literally. Right. And, and I noticed that uh, I think even Serena and Venus, Serena was the younger sister. So that's that's interesting. Just in yeah. a natural way. Yeah. Just a natural way yeah. that I didn't even know what I was doing. I just knew that I loved to do it. And I was doing it like I would before I went to Nice High School and uh, down near Nocatee now. And before school, I wanted to just hit bunker shots and chip on a green. So I would like I go to Ponte Vedra where they had a chipping green and I'd park my car right near this near that. And I do that for 45 minutes because I loved it, not because I wanted to be number one or because um, anything else was just because just just because I loved it. So I couldn't get enough of it. Saturday morning, I was out there practicing, you know, when maybe other people weren't. So um, I think that had a lot to do with it. You know, all the, all the time that I put into it because golf is so individual that I improve those skills just because I love, I love doing it. Yeah. So, so yeah. So it's like, just like anything you got to put in the hour. So not only did you outwork everyone, you learned faster than other people. And that was without social media. Like what was the aha moment where you were like, man, like if I knew this tip a year earlier, like, was there anything like that that went through your golf journey that like really took you from like being very good to being world-class? Well, right when you said the aha moment, I would say I was playing in a national amateur event and I was in 11th grade. It was my June, it was my, uh, January of my 11th grade. Okay. And I was down in Miami. It's called the Dixie amateur. And I was leading the tournament by one shot uh, going into 18 and down in at, at this golf course, Key Biscayne golf course, 18 is like that narrow par five water on both sides. And I just got back there with a driver and I'm like, I'm just going to hit this as hard as I can because if it goes in the water, at least maybe I'll get, be able to get down there somewhere and be able to drop it and maybe make a par. So it was a rare back swing and the ball went right down the middle. And that was probably my moment, you know, at that point where I ended up winning by two. So I win this national amateur event. I'm 16 years old. And I went from really good junior golfer to top 10 in the country of amateur golfers. And that got me into all the amateur national amateur events. It got me uh, more on the map for college golf. And that was my, that was my moment. I got to plug in. (laughs) So what happened that that was probably it right there um, that put me on the map. And then, you know, then all the college golfers wanted me to come visit. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. It seems like, uh, you know, you're the second pro athlete, you know, they got that platform. You put yourself in position to win. You got the win and then it took you further elsewhere. Let me let me ha- let me get to these questions from my uh, my buddy Eric Van Trump. He better be listening when this hits, and uh, he's got he's a he's a, a golf golf. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty. Of, you've met a lot a of junkie, golf fanatics. A golf junkie, a golf junkie, a lot of golf fanatics. I'm sure you met a lot over the years. I'm in, we're in a golf town, Ponte Vedra Beach, Atlantic Beach. I'm a tennis guy though, but uh, there's golfers everywhere, neighbors. So and they're on the pro tour. Okay. So he said, uh, uh, hopefully these tie into the never broke again aspect, but how much of an influence do you think having or not having fans at a golf tournament makes? Tricky. I think that, I think there's something to be said about if you had, we'll take the non golf fans. If you have, well, maybe he might be talking about COVID. Possibly, yeah. I'm not. I'm yeah. not. I'm not sure the context. If, but if you, if you have, if you have a tour event with non golf fans, the best, the best golfers week after week after week, they're going to show up. You know, they're going to show up after four rounds. They're going to be 
in that top 20, you know, compared to the other 120. They're going to, you know, the best golfers will just show up. Doesn't matter if there's fans or no fans or trees in the middle of a fairway or greens that are six on the snip. It doesn't matter. Best golfers are going to, they're going to peel up, peel higher, but it is an intangible. You know, it's an intangible where if you have 10,000 people on the first tee, if you have, you know, 50,000 people on that back nine, what I call an intangible of momentum. And it's hard to measure momentum, you know, and people do that. The, the, The golf fans do that. They create a buzz. They create that, that adrenaline, you know, that you might not say, and that's hard to measure. So that's a tricky one. You ever worry yeah, about no. hitting anyone? Sure. <laughs> sure. You know, like. Have you, have you ever hit anybody oh, yeah. with a ball? I've, I've sent it oh, right into no. the people and it's a bad feeling. Oh, yeah. You try oh. not to, but. Um, At least yeah. the rough is uh, a little bit batted down over there if they're I standing mean, on I, it. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau hit me last year at oh, TPC. Really? So I was out with some okay? friends and um, we we're on the number seventh hole at TPC. And we were about, you know, we were about that 300 distance, 300 yard distance off on the right side of the hole. And he hits this drive and I, I see the volunteer, you know, got the stand and the volunteer's like, it's going that way. So I'm like, hey, everybody watch. So it, it hits the cart path and, and bounces right into my leg. So um, did, then it, it kicked and then it went, you know, went to the friendly side of the rough, not into the trees. So I helped them make a par. So that was fun. But of all people, you know, Bryson, is, uh, <laughs> he's quite a controversial character. All right. What is the best advice you can give an under 10 handicap golfer? I'm like a 25. Josh is actually probably an under 10. Yeah. Try and so play. He, he's going to be interested. Try and play with people that are better than you because okay. now you're talking about picking up one or two shots here or there and <laughs> try and literally pick up advice from really good golfers um, and take notice of probably take notice of your short game. Like take notice of how many putts are you making inside of like 10 feet? Uh, How many times are you able to get the ball up and down off the green and stuff like that? Just very, those are, that's a very, uh, that's a tough one to, let me that's a good good business a good business anal, 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 me, uh, so when you're playing with a when you're playing on tour land like obviously you know who like the best of the best are and then obviously you know who people who are there's some people on the golf tour who are just looking to make it like they're just looking to make the cut to survive and stay on tour like when you play with those people that are top tier does it elevate your game or does it kind of intimidate you a little bit or a little bit of both I think it elevates. I, you know, I, I always knew that if I was a hundred ranked player and I was playing with a ten ranked player, it was definitely uh, noticeable. You know, um, but I def I think in overall it definitely elevated me. What do you think the difference is between the ten and the hundred on the tour? More you mindset, think it's just flag or yeah, more mindset than skills. I mean, a little bit of skills. You know, the guy might be able to hit the ball 10 yards further than you, or he might be able to putt better than you, or there might be a little bit of a skill thing, but it's more mindset. Uh, they probably expect more out of themselves. Yeah, because if you're the 10th ranked player versus 100, your average score is maybe a stroke or two, maybe if that difference. About a, about a half a shot difference. So that's crazy. A half crazy. a shot. It's crazy. That's why that's why it's hard to measure on PJ Tour. Like we had a guy, the guy last last week just won. This guy, Tom Hoagie. You know, so he and Jordan Spieth were battling head to head and Tom Hoagie wins. Nobody knows who Tom Hoagie is, but he's been out there 15 years and he's had a good career, but now he's a PJ Tour winner. So it's just like that fine margin. How did he beat Jordan Spieth by two shots when speed was up the whole round up until like the last five holes. Do you like so, being behind or ahead in a tournament? Probably for me, a little behind, you know, yeah. like, I, you know, Hey, you'd like to say, Hey, I'd like to be four shots ahead and, and keep rolling. But, you know, looking back on my PGA tour career, I'd say a little behind was a good spot for me. And, uh, 
and, and, and my two wins on tour, I was, I was behind and I came from, came from back to, to win. So, all right, I'll, I'll keep rolling here. He said, how often would you seek out new clubs to improve your game? My big brother said a professional never blames his tools. <laughs> he said that a hundred times growing up. Cause he, I'd be like, oh, it's my racket or my stick. And he would, and he's, he was eight years older than me also. He'd be like, oh, professional. So what, what, I guess, what do you think? How often would you seek out new clubs to improve your game? I was, that's a good question. I was, I was very close with Arnold Palmer, you know, coming out of Wake Forest. Um, he was, you know, he's the king of golf and he was Mr. Wake Forest and all that. And he had open oh, wow. policy. Okay. It was a great relationship that I had with him. And I, I made it a point to go see him. So like in, if I was traveling, Anywhere in Pennsylvania in the summertime, I'd stop at his house and he had his office down in Orlando. So that was a two hour drive to Bay Hill that I would go, you know, see him when he was at Bay Hill. And he's the kind of guy that he told me that we had this conversation that it's it's never he said it's never you. It's always the clubs. And he he (laughs) believed that he believed that so much inside. Wow. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, but you know, like, so then I thought about what he, I, I, I didn't, I just said, oh, I said, I didn't say anything. I just listened to him. But then days later, you know, I'm like, well, you're eight under par through a round and you snap hook a drive in the water on 18. It wasn't the driver that did that because you're eight under par at that point, you, you know? So it, it was, you just choked, you know what I mean? But, he yeah. truly believed that, that his mindset was he couldn't go there to where, you know, he'd hit the bad drive on 18 because of his mind. It was always the club, and he really believed that. I don't believe that. Like, I was a, I was the, I'm the other way. I'm more like, if I have clubs that work, I'm going to make them work. I'm, I'm going to live with those things until technology is so much better, then I'll switch a club. But I was very slow to change my stuff. I had a three-wood that I played with for about 15 years and a putter for about the same irons wear out, you know, the grooves. So I would change irons about every two years because of the grooves wedges. I would change every three months. Mm -hmm. Uh, How often, how often do you consider yourself playing? Like, you know, obviously probably more, when you were in your in earlier years or mid, but what, like how often are you playing now versus then? Well, I was, I was competing in tournaments like every on average, every three out of four weeks, you know, throughout the whole year. So there's a lot of tournaments. I'm only playing in like five tournaments a year now where I used to be playing 30 to 35 in a year. So that's like 200 days a year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 200 well, yeah, you know. in, in competition. So, you know, the travel right. and all that, but like, you know, casually I'll go, I'll go out and play four or five days a week now. Yeah. You know, okay. but it's casual oh. stuff. It's not, you know, like, so a typical tour day would be an hour practice, go play 18 walking. And then um, like two or three hours after that of different practice skills. So it was a seven to f- five day six days a week kind of thing 30 plus weeks okay. I, i'm just thinking yeah like to me i play golf maybe once a month at the most but you're playing a lot more I, i'm probably overthinking this all right no what i gotta is, i want i want to bring it right. back i want to i want to bring it back oh. like we can't just oh. we can't just go past arnold palmer that fast oh that, that is true that we is can't true. go past mr or mr palmer however you want to refer to him <laughs> he's important right in the golf he's world. important and len had a relationship with him so i'm sure a lot of That's people true. who are golf fans or know about golf like never had an opportunity to meet he's basically a legend it so was, like it was a great it was, it was what, really great. what's like the most memorable thing like you and him did together did, was it playing was it just talking I stopped at his house in Latrobe for three days and I got to see Arnie kind of just being Arnie where down in Orlando, he got, he, I would, I would be at his office. Uh, and that was above the Bay Hill clubhouse. So he had about four office rooms up there where Arnold Palmer mm-hmm. enterprises was, but Latrobe, Pennsylvania, I got to see his house and uh, his office there and play golf with him and, 
had breakfast with him, you know, like wake up, have breakfast with him in his, in his kitchen. And he'd say stuff like, yeah, I just went out and walked the dogs for a half hour. I took him in the shower with me. He goes, I take my dog, my two dogs in the shower and, you know, clean them up, you know, and that's Arnie. But Arnie was a people guy. He loved people. Like he really loved people. Not like it was a, it was a good thing to do and, and look at and look like he loved, he loved people. And he was genuinely interested. He had the great combination of being one of the top golfers in the world and loving people. Hmm. You know, was there any difference between Arnold Palmer, the golfer and Arnold Palmer, the person? No, very similar. You know, he, he was, he was, he's kind of sexy. I mean, he's a sexy guy, you know, like <laughs> he, he, he just, he, he was interested in you. He genuinely was interested, you know? And, and so you have this, usually the top golfers are just, you know, like the sign the autograph and, you know, like just when can I get out of here? Because they want their private time. Arnie never rushed, never signed it every signature of Arnold Palmer was literally it looked like it took him five minutes to sign that signature it's perfect <laughs> so he he was really cool then he's yeah. like a cool he's like Elvis he was cool so, so yeah what what uh who's the hardest working pro you uh, you don't say yourself but who is the hardest working pro you've ever seen I would say People probably would know Tom Kite as well, but when I first got on tour, Tom Kite was a top ten golfer. Him and VJ Singh, I would say those hardest two working pros. Yeah. It, so, wh- who do you think is the least hardworking, most talented? Like, because I feel like talent steps in, it gets you to a level, right? And it gets you there, but can talent get you into the top? So you still don't have to work hard. Yeah, sure can. Yeah, I mean, you know, okay. and again, it's he's an older guy. He's actually passed away. Um, Bruce Litsky. Bruce Litsky never practiced. <laughs> never. And he was a top, like, if you look him up, Bruce Litsky. I mean, he died, he died too early. He died at like 65 years old, 63 years old, brain cancer, I think it was. Um, he never practiced. And he played limited. Like he played like I played 30 to 35 events. He would play 18, 16, 18. And he was in a top 30 year after year. And just literally like, and then when the season ended in October, he would not play. Like, you know, I had friends that knew him and it wasn't just like lure and, you know, and he'd sneak out to the course. He wouldn't play in November, December, and January. Would not play. (laughs) Here's a funny story. I don't know if you ever heard this. He's like a fat baseball player that can hit, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so here's a funny story. The last term of the year was the last week of October, the tour championship. And that was the story. Like he goes, once I finish, I don't I don't pick get my clubs out in November, December, and January until the beginning of the next season. So his caddy put a banana into the head cover of the driver, kind of as a joke. <laughs> And at that time they were wood, they were wood, uh, wood heads, you know? So the, yeah. the, the bag, banana goes in the club, the clubs get packed and off Bruce goes home. And that thing didn't open up until January. That banana was all mushed. The head was gone. The head was destroyed because of the moisture in the banana. They, you know, he had a really nice driver and the driver was destroyed wow. because of it. But True story. I mean, he didn't open it up. He just kept it in the corner for like months. Crazy. How about a combination? How about a combination of the two? Most guys, yeah, most guys fit in that. Most guys, most guys have that. They know that they they have some downtime, but then they just whether they feel like I need to practice or they want to practice. Most guys are in that middle area of of talent and hard work. Yeah. I just Maybe. saw like yeah yeah the other day I went out to TPC and I just saw Jim Furyk chipping on the green and it's fifty degrees and windy and it's just chipping. So most guys are like that. They just they just they just enjoy doing it. Do you see anybody that is not talented but hard work and make it? Usually those guys aren't around more than a year or two. Okay, they just they can't sustain it. If you're not, maybe, yeah. maybe Bruce's secret was he just was like having fun the whole time and he was just always fresh. 
He was fresh. Definitely fresh. I feel fresh. like golf you could burn out fast. He 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 uh, he he was very good friends with my longtime coach, Jim McLean. They were schoolmates at University of Houston. So Jim got to know Bruce over the years really well. And that's what Jim Jim said. Bruce goes, Why should I practice? Like he goes, I'm just there's no reason to. It's just I, I have a clear idea on what I'm trying to do, and he kept things real simple. <laughs> what did he do in the offseason? What, what was he doing? He just hanging around his house. <laughs> <laughs> he would go – he he did like fishing and hunting. He did like that. So oh, okay. That was – yeah. That Probably kept, had good good head head on his shoulders then. He sure did. Yeah, and then, you know, like you're, you're in a major tournament, like at the Masters of the U.S. Open, and, you know – he felt like he should win just like Jack Nicholas. And he was up against Nicholas and Watson and Johnny Miller and Tom Weisskopf and all those greats. And he was top 30 player. So do you think hard, do you think hard work would have helped him? Probably not. Or him. do you think that was what, what made him so good? Probably not not. Him. Yeah. Probably not him, you know, because he, okay. he really couldn't get much better. He won like 14 times on tour. So yeah. It's just yeah, it's, that was that's just one out of a, that's just a style. billion. You, yeah, you mentioned the Masters, so most people will never get to play that golf course. And you, how many times have you played there? I played in three Master tournaments, so, so at least twelve rounds there plus practice rounds. Yeah, talk talk about just walking that course. Not even like you came second in the Masters, which is better than any pretty much any golfer in the world is going to do. But like, just talk about like the experience of being there and like walking that course and just like looking around, and be like, "Holy crap!" Like, yeah, what is that's, this? That's yeah, that's exactly how it is. The Masters is is very unique in the sense that when we had these majors, the PGA, the U.S. Open, and the Open Championship, the, those other three majors, they rotate on a lot of different courses, and the Masters is the only one. You know, like. Like, Andrew, you talked about tennis, like the U.S. Open, right? Tennis tournament is always in New York. So I'm sure when tennis players go there, they have a certain feel. And that's how the Masters is. It's a very unique, special place because that tournament's been there since 1930 at the same course. So it's a very intimate feel that you know. It's like it's like the old friend. You know, you come, you, you come see the old friend and you just know how that friend's going to be. The land itself is amazing. It's very hilly. The, the, the clubhouse sits up high, and then the course kind of flows off it. Um, so these holes are side hills, uphill, downhill. Number 10 has a downhill drop of probably 100 feet uh, from, from tee to green with a dog leg through the pines. So it's beautiful. It's got creeks, pine trees, hills. Uh, so the – and. You know, as far as walking, like if someone said, hey, let's follow a, a, a golfer and let's walk as they play and watch 18 holes, it's physically demanding. You know, because of the ups and downs, you're probably walking about seven or eight miles, but up and down these grades of 15, 20 percent. So um, that's unusual because, you know, like someone comes here to the Players Championship and if they walk that course, it's very flat. And pretty tight together, and 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 uh, dust is a little bit more spread out that way. So, so good good workout. All right. Speaking of Masters, uh, his next question was, "What is the most important golf shot you ever hit?" Well, the sexy answer, okay, <laughs> is winning my first tournament winning my first PGA tour event. And, it, and I was on tour for seven years until I won on the 18th hole at L, L, LA, the Riviera open or at the LA open. Uh, I hit an eight iron and as boring as this sounds, I hit the eight iron right in the middle of the green and two putted to win. So the guy I was playing with Scott McCarron had a nine iron. We were right next to each other and his nine iron, he hit left of the green and didn't get up and down. And we, we were tied. So my eight iron beat his nine iron and uh, I won by one. And that, that, that gave me my first win. It gave, you know, it vaulted me a hundred spots in the world ranking, you know, mm. money wise. I made that at that point, I made $680,000 uh, for that nice. win, a two and a half year exemption on tour, got me into everything, all the world championship events. So it was, 
it was basically like a five million dollar shop you know that that shot because like all the other shots on that on that round were important but that one was the final shot that really meant the most and then and then i would say even to back up the the one that was behind the scenes that nobody knows that it was not on camera was i was in the uh, you know how i don't know if you ever heard about the qualifying school like in order to get onto the pga tour there is a what's called a Q school, and at that time, I was we. It's six rounds. It's six rounds of golf to to you know, and the top fifty make it to get onto the PGA Tour the next year. And on the last hole, I was in some pine trees. This was in Houston, and I was in some pine trees, and I had a shoot, but the shoot took me out to the lake, and I had to hit like a, a hooking six iron to get onto the green, and I did it. So a big kind of high hook six iron onto the green two putt, and I got my my PGA Tour uh, playing privileges. So that was like I look at that shot, and you know it's a what if if I don't pull that shot off and I make a bogey or double bogey, I don't make the PGA Tour, and then who knows what happens? You know, like you know because that is such a grind um, mm-hmm. of, of of golf to get onto the PGA Tour. I want to go back so to the we Masters, were... dude. We, we skipped over the Masters too fast. Andrew, you're going too fast, man. We skipped over Arnold, Arnold Palmer. We skipped yeah, over the Masters. Because I'm not a golf guy. I'm not a golf guy. I mean, like, you know what I mean? The Masters, bro. Masters. Like, what what are you thinking when you're walking the course? Like, how do you prepare for that? Because it is a special place. Well, I played there. My first Masters, I played there as an amateur. I was in college and, you know, I told you I, I was number one ranked junior and then I won that tournament and I got vaulted into the top 10. That got me, if you're top 10 ranked amateur golfers, that gets you onto the Walker Cup team, which mm-hmm. is like the Ryder Cup for amateurs. So it's the top 10 best amateurs against the top 10 in Europe best amateurs. So when... At that time, when you got picked to that team, you got an invite to the Masters the next year. So as a junior in college, I played in the Masters as an amateur, oh, and it was incredible. Wow. I missed the cut by about four, but I was just happy being in the Masters. You know, I stayed at the Crow's Nest right on top in the clubhouse. So I'd wake up, and I'd look out the window, and I could see 18 green. I mean, it was incredible. You know, you could eat all your meals right there in the clubhouse. So I didn't have to deal with $300 hotel rooms or two hour line traffic to get into the course and anything like that. So that was a real treat as an amateur. But as a more serious note, when I got in, when I got invited as a pro, because I won those, I won my, my first two tour events. And then the next year I got invited to play. I took it serious. So I went there, I went there and I, uh, I went, I went there in December before the event, February and March to play two rounds, two rounds uh, in preparation each time. So I got to see like what I was going to be faced with in April. And so even though it was January, February, March, I knew like I knew, for example, the first hole. You, you most likely have an iron shot that's on an incline like like that, straight up. And, not, you know, how often do you hit a six iron like like on that hill to a blind green? So I would, I would hit those practice shots in January, February, March, getting ready. A lot of the chipping that was very unique at, at Augusta, I, I kind of got the feel for the chipping. Uh, number 10 is like this. So like, you know, a downhill lie with a six iron. So number 13, the par five that goes around Ray's Creek, you're hitting like almost from your knee height, uh, the ball way above your feet with about a five wood or something, a three iron. So that was very unique. So when I got there and hit those shots in December, I was terrible. Like I was like, shit, I'm like, I'm going to suck this, you know, like. I, so I need, like, I noticed, you know, it's like learning Chinese. If you, someone, if someone gave you a, a Chinese paper and they're like, read the Chinese, you're like, I, I couldn't even start, you know, you, you know, so that I went to work, 
And then January, February, March, I hit all those preparation shots. So when I got there first week of April, I felt like I played there eight years. I felt like I had an advantage and I, I knew what I was doing. So I had high confidence. Mm-hmm. And How uh, would you explain playing there to someone? Um, it could be overwhelming because of the history yeah. and the tradition of it, you know, like because that's the one major that everybody goes back to. So even everybody, if you turn it on TV, you know that 16 is that par three with the water left. You just know what – you feel like it's an old friend. So you could get caught up with – when I played a practice round one time with – I get these names. Arnie, Roger Malpe, and Tom Watson, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, that was my first Masters. And Malpe walking down number 10 – and number 10 is a really cool down dog leg left through the pines with the shadows. It's all amazing. And Malpe goes, you know, the Masters doesn't really start till the back nine at Augusta, you know, on Sunday. And Arnie just smiled, you know, and he kind of nodded. He didn't say anything, but you're right. So when I was, I was uh, at that point about seventh place on Sunday going down number 10, that kind of came back into my head like, damn, this is where it all starts, you know? So uh, you could get caught up in that whole lore and, you know, romance, but um, Mm -hmm. you still got to put your head down and hit the shots. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be making bogeys and doubles quick. Yeah. I know Andrew's got more questions, but I had, I had one thing. I I forgot them now. I forgot (laughs) them. Blacked out. Uh, I met this well, guy and I asked, I asked this guy who played golf. I was like, where's the coolest place you played? He's like, I played Augusta. I was like, how was it? And he's like, have you ever had an eight hour orgasm? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, he goes, that's, that's the only way I could describe it. Well, and and that was, was probably oh, two rounds because they play fast there. So he probably played two rounds in one day. Uh, yeah, but that's they, how he it, described it to me. And I'll never an, forget that incredible. answer. It's incredible. It is. It's like, the creeks are amazing, you know, like the, the green, the green complexes, how they position themselves. Uh, it, it is an amazing place. It's, it's like, it's like heaven. That's mm-hmm. for Andrew, have you watched the masters? I, I think it's on sometimes when I'm, you know, the TV and it's ESPN and man, I'm, you know, I'm like, I, yeah, I want to jump in and ask questions. I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, <laughs> it's a, it's like heaven. Like, you know, like if you, yeah. in whatever field you're at, Whatever feel if you can, it, it, whatever work you do, if you have a heavenly place, it's that. Yeah, it's, it's that good, and it just so happens it's the first major of the year, so it's like it, the excitement, you know, of almost like golf is really starting this at this time of the year. You know, that first week of April is springtime. The freaking azaleas are going. I mean, it's it's all that. So you came, you came in second. Who came in first that? I came in second that year. I lost in a playoff there. Uh, Mike Weir. Oh. Mike Weir won. He's a, a Canadian lefty. Great name. Weirzy. Yeah. And, uh, Weirzy. yeah, he won. So he was in that last group. Um, I was like – I was five shots back going into Sunday. And I shot a 65 that Sunday round. I was on fire. And, uh, oh, nice. yeah. So then – we tied, and then he won the playoff. We went down number ten uh, in the playoff, and he beat me on ten, and that was it. I mean, it was. Do, do you think if you had like a hype man, you would have you would you would do better? Yeah, I needed that. I definitely needed. Seriously? That. Yeah, I needed some like you mean like somebody in my ear. Is that what you mean? Dude, like Len, you're the you're the goat, man. You're gonna I nail needed, this shot. Yeah, like, I, you think that would mess you up, or would that help? Like Boonini Brown from Muhammad Ali. I needed somebody in my ear, you know, saying. Was you're the the greatest. Greatest. You got this. You got this. Come on. I don't know. Maybe it would distract you. I don't know if it would be no, good. It would have I'm just like curious. I would have probably punched Mike Weir out, and then I, then I would have won. So I <laughs> <laughs> it's a pop. Is there is there a rule in golf that you can't fight? Is that in the rule book? I'm not sure about I'm sure that. It's against the rules. I mean, I haven't seen it. You're allowed yeah, to fight and not like make me a karate and, uh, kick. Other big guy fight like that. Never see it coming. Do it the back. Have of you ever head. have you ever been in a fight, Len? <laughs> have you ever been in a fight? I stood up uh, one time. Not really. Non brothers, non brothers, obviously, because I'm sure they. My brother, 
My one brother beat me up. Oh, my other brother, Ken, was always kind of always, you know, out the door. Um, he was a little older, but Bob always beat me up. I mean, if you guys ever see Bob, you should tell him how mean he was to me. But he always beat me up. And he'd say as he's beating me up and I'm on the ground, he's like, this is going to make you tougher. This is going to make you better <laughs> as oh, no. I'm crying. And, uh, Thank you, brother. Yeah, I'm sure he lo- you love that, right? You see Bob throw the brother. water in his face for me. <laughs> um, but one, one time on the one time on the school bus, some kid was making fun of my sister and calling her names. So, oh, when we got off the school bus, yeah, I got him. But uh, snap, that's it. Headshot or gut? Head or gut? Head. Nice. <laughs> one. How many? How many hits? I don't know. Three or four. Did he get any back? No. Oh wow! Yeah, it was okay. good. How old? Was good. How old were you? I was uh, sixth grade. Okay. Yeah. yeah, those are volatile years. They can be. She was first grade, so you know she's just sitting there. You know. What does he say? What did he say about your sister? Uh, what is going on? He was calling her names. He's calling her pork chop. He's just being a bully. Pork chop. Pork Anti-bullying. Pork. That's right. right. So that's where it all began. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Talk about all right, that. So, so, so let me let me knock out Eric's last question. What is the nicest course you've ever played, conditions wise? Well, you know, it's funny. We talk about Augusta, right? And Augusta during that time is amazing. Like the greens are just like your kitchen table um, or your driveway, you know, like they're hard and fast and it's perfect. But throughout the year, they keep it average. Like they keep it, you know, it's nice, but it's not like Augusta during the tournament. I would say, well, Pebble Beach is probably the nicest place just because of on the ocean. Um all the views, I mean, like 15 out of 18 holes, you, you see the water crashing into the, in the ocean and all that on the rocks. And I'd say Pebble is the best. What, where is Pebble? That's in Cali, right? Yeah, California. Yeah, right below San, right, Francisco, right below San Francisco, Monterey. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Pebble Beach reminds me of Happy Gilmore. <laughs> when he's got the guy yelling at him, he's like, get your – Get your towel and your suntan lotion because you're never getting off your beach. You ever deal with that on the tour, Len? You ever get yeah, people say something? Did anybody to you? run and hit the hit the ball? Like run and hit? Is that like is that a thing or is that is- not not? It's not really a thing for uh, when we when we mess around. You know, it might be when guys let loose a little bit, but ne- you never see that on the tour. Why not? Is it hard to control that the the p- placement of it or well? Just recently, I'd say in the last couple of years, the long drive, you know, the long drive guys have gotten more visibility. TV's picked it up more. Uh, ratings are pretty good for long drive. And then when, when the long drive guys, they, they kind of go, you know, they kind of go like this for a little bit. And then right. boom, like that, you know, so that's right. about as big as it gets. But we're kind of finding out that that type of momentum back and forth gives a little bit more power and speed. But the whole happy Gilmore starting from back is, uh, we don't we don't really see that. Right. I, I don't yeah, it's like baseball, you know, the mechanics, you know, you gotta tw- twist your body a little bit. And then I've been studying the mechanics in baseball because my boy plays baseball. So I'm like, how do we you gotta I don't know. <laughs> but there's a lot of lot of like like little things you can do to improve your stroke. Were you just a natural? Did you focus on that kind of stuff, like little tweaks, or were you just like I got, I got it. I just need to, I just need the reps. Starting out when, starting out younger, it was all natural. No lessons, yeah. just kind of see and do completely yeah. natural. But then when I turned professional, then I got some tweaks along the way to, to, you know, really like, you know, you know, like just to turn pro you're at a certain level, but then to, to be able to play PGA tour and to make money at, at, at golf is, is a whole nother level. So, you know, then I had to kind of get better skills pretty much. So do those help you tweaking, you know, oh, making yeah. adjustments yeah. to your game? Yeah, definitely. And not only, not only position, you know, position wise, like that's one thing, like uh, some instructor can say, okay, here's a position that you need to be in. And that's, that's good. But then the whole coaching aspect of how to practice, what to thinking about when you're practicing that whole coaching aspect is is so much is so important as well as. Just well, what are you supposed to think about while you're practicing? 
Well, like how to practice, you know. So, for example, mm-hmm. as, a, as a golfer, we're so individual. We don't have a coach tell us what to do. So on a typical practice day, say, say today, I go, to, I go to TPC to practice. What am I going to do? I'm just going to go putt around the green? Or am I going to have certain practice drills? And what are those practice drills to be able to get the most out of your skills? You know, so like you can just go to the range and hit golf balls and kind of like check in, check out. Or you can try and do like performance drills, for example. So, for example, can you hit 30 t- 30 drivers? Like if I had 30 golf balls and I had my driver and I have – there's two targets out there that are – say like that blue pin and the red pin that are 40 yards apart. Can I hit 30 drives inside those flags? And if I can't, how many are going to the left and how many are going to the right? So more measuring performance stuff as you're practicing. Analytics, measured performance. Even as it, if Josh and I go to the putting green and I say to Josh, all right, Josh, we got a four foot putt. And can we make 20 in a row? from four feet. Hmm. Okay. So when Josh gets to that 12, 13, 14, 15, he's going to feel more pressure on that, you know, on those putts going down because they mean more like the, 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 the one, two and three are just the same. But when you are grinding on that, like 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 putt, now you're strengthening your mind as well as your skills. So things like that, you get way more, way more better results when you have that type of practice. When you put that reps, reps, get your reps in everybody, get your reps in to be successful. All right. We're coming up on, on our time limit here. So um, yeah, just kind of, you run a charity now, right? So tell us a little bit about that. We got about two minutes. Well, my Len Matisse Foundation has evolved over the years. So even when I, we've been doing this now 20 plus years. And early on, the first four, five, six years, it was to have a end of the year event where a lot of amateur golfers get together and we raise money for the first tee. And that was good, but it was one time a year. So now over the last five, six years, I've tweaked it to where we have monthly events um, and they're smaller but they go to different clubs and we have these nine hole events that we combine members of the clubs with the first tee juniors. So they play together. We raise money, goes back to the first tee. And now the members get to see all these first tee kids and the kids are great. So that's on the golf side. On the other side, we have a stop the bullying campaign and we were kind of kidding about the bullying earlier, but um, for the last three or four years, we have a hundred percent support of Duval County here in Jacksonville uh, inside the schools. So presently right now, we're in 30 middle schools in Duval County doing the Stop the Bullying campaign initiatives with the kids. And now because of our good funding, because people donate, we're able to give scholarships to middle school students all over Duval County. Our goal is to move it to St. John's County and Clay County and Nassau County and branch out and to make this thing really big in the uh, state of Florida. Yeah, having that conversation is great. I bet it's entertaining to hear some of these conversations when you're in the schools. Like, like he did this, he called, like, he, he, my hair, you know, I hear about it all the time with my kids. And so they, they definitely need it. I mean, anybody in public school, in, in private, I'm not, I, I went to public and private. I'm not, I think, I don't know if private really needs it. Um, I'm not going to say they don't, but definitely public. There's just so many kids. Yeah, a lot of kids. Uh, in fact, like with the it's way more diverse. Thirty middle schools that, that causes a lot of yeah, issues. Thirty middle schools. We're involved in twenty five. We're it's twenty five thousand kids um, that yeah, that, that's... that are seeing our bullying uh, initiatives. So uh, or stop the bullying initiatives. So, but yeah, private schools. It's a big problem. Big problem. Yeah, a lot it, of... it definitely happens in private schools, but there's just less kids. Less kids. That's right. I, I definitely. Yeah. They, they, I, who hasn't gotten bullied, right? I guess if you're the, I don't even know the bullies get, it's like, there's always somebody richer. There's always somebody more who hasn't yeah. gotten bullied, you know? Yeah. The, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 the Duval County public office school office um, says, look, we do the code of conduct stuff. We do stuff during the year, but 
if you guys are committed to what you you want to do, we we would like that. So good for them to kind of say we we could use that extra help, and we're happy yeah. to do it and send the right message. I, I think that there's definitely never enough. Having that yeah. conversation is huge. Yeah. Just to have that that topic continuously flowing in the in the student in the student. Yeah, we want to kind of turn it around. Important. We we want to make that environment better for the, safer and better for the yeah. school uh, for the kids. So when the kids go to school. You know, they they have a better feeling about where they are for what eight hours a day. Yeah. All right, Josh, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thanks for coming on, Len. Check Len out, check out his foundation, and uh we'll see you tonight, Len. Thanks, guys. Enjoy. Thanks, Len. See you.